The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Well, have you ever experienced someone who is a deep and profound believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you ever met someone who is so committed to preaching a gospel that's bigger than their race, their class, their culture? Have you ever met someone who is so committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ as a holistic message, a holistic whole life message, Yes, a whole life message, one where our relationship with God and our relationship with each other are not preached as two separate messages. Well, it is an honor to give tribute to John M. Perkins on today. As a leading voice out of the civil rights era, John Perkins is well known for his profound preaching He's well known for his writings and his teachings on community development and reconciliation and is a nationally recognized and, and really an icon as it relates to biblical reconciliation around the world. As one of Mississippi's uh, famous sons, along with Oprah Winfrey and Elvis, <laughs> John brought together business leaders to the table of Christian community development long before many others even considered it. Across the country, innovative ministries have formed in healthcare forums and fellowships and business leader roundtables and innovative programs and ministries that integrate all types of, of folks into the conversation. Those folks see John as the impetus, as the wise sage, as the uh, the profit behind their innovation. Well, not only do people see John's entrepreneurial spirit as a key contributor to their formation as leaders, John sees himself as an entrepreneur. As the director of the center for the last 16 years, I've had the opportunity to see John envision community transformation. I've seen John ask the question, who's not at the table? I've seen John envision and I've learned how to sit back and figure out how to engineer his architecture. How do we operationalize how he sees leadership development in light of reconciliation and community development? How do we get the least, the last, and the lost to the table? and make them not someone who we talk to, but someone who we talk with. All of this would mean nothing if John wasn't waking up each morning spending time with the, with the Word of God. You can catch him at five in the morning spending time with God, calling his longtime colleague and friend. Just a few hours later, you can catch him at the prison a few hours later, at 86 years old, you'll have to catch him at the airport. <laughs> you would think a man at 86 would be able to have some time in his schedule, but no, not John Perkins. <laughs> well, John, uh, for John, relationships matter. He says his donors are his friends. At times, I've met people who he called his friends, and, and I later found out that they were donors, and I really couldn't tell the difference by the way they interacted. For John, as I said, relationships matter, and John has led generation after generation into understanding faith and relationship to all of life. And he has preached this way for 60 years. Well, one evening, 
I was at a fundraiser and I was blessed to sit at the head table and in walks the keynote speaker. The keynote speaker was a 20 year division two head basketball coach. I was nervous and agitated and anxious all at the same time as I tried to do my best to eat with the right fork and the leader said to me, the coach said to me, so what do you do? It was obvious what he did. And I said, um, kind of shyly, hey, I, I direct the John Perkins Center, because usually when I say that, I might have to do some explaining. Who is John Perkins? Immediately he responded, the John Perkins? The Pasadena John Perkins? The Mississippi John Perkins? I sat back in my chair and I said, yeah. I really didn't know what the next word was going to be. He said to me, you tell Reverend Perkins that he changed my life. He came to speak while I was a student at UCLA for Athletes in Action, and he taught, taught us that ministry, my faith, and my vocation are not three separate movements. And he goes, I knew from then that I could coach as a calling. Well, I was at another event, and a neurosurgeon walked up to me, introduced himself, and said, can you please tell John that he inspired me to take my calling as a neurosurgeon to other countries using these principles of Christian community development and to develop clinics where we're building leadership from the ground up. Well, I, I've become used to these stories. The one I wasn't used to was when I was courting my wife and I met her father. And he queried me on a whole lot of things. <laughs> but the one thing he queried me the most on was my vocation as the director of the John Perkins Center. Do you really know John? Here was his test question. You can give a man a fish, and you'll feed him for a day. You can teach the man how to fish and feed him for a lifetime. And he paused. He paused because those who know John Perkins knows John added a third stanza to that. The real question is, who owns the pond? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could go on and on telling you stories about John. He's made a tremendous impact in our country and in our world. Many of us fondly refer to his teachings as <clears throat> the three R's of Christian community development. Reconciliation, relocation, and redistribution. And then John goes, if you think I'm talking about redistribution in terms of taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor, you've deified money. And the audience sits back. This 86-year-old man, year man hasn't lost one step in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. From this man with a third grade education, but with 14 honorary doctorate degrees, with positional appointments in different presidential administrations. We have learned from John how to change the world. It's by this deep belief in the holistic gospel of Jesus Christ. It is as it's a belief that in this, in this holistic gospel that there aren't two messages of the gospel. It is this deep and profound belief that has led John to develop leaders all over this world. And what we're seeing now is millennials in our institution of Seattle Pacific University line up to listen to this grandfather tell of biblical reconciliation. I want to end with this story that John often tells when he gets together and someone asks him, what is the impetus behind your 
ministry, John? What's the motivation? Why do you do what you do? Why, why did you meet with the Ku Klux Klansmen who attempted to assassinate you? And why did you work towards reconciliation with the state troopers who beat you down and left you for dead? Why did you then come out of that and talk about forgiveness and biblical reconciliation? Why, John? And John says this. I never really had a relationship with my mother. She died probably from malnutrition as I nurtured from her. I didn't really know my father either. And in a broken voice, John will say, one day when I get to heaven, probably before I meet Paul and probably before I even have a handshake with Jesus, I'm going to meet my mother. My mother's going to ask me, what did you do for people like me? And I promised myself I wouldn't cry when I got to this point. <laughs> John says, his mother's going to ask him, what did you do for people like me? I hope the motivation for what we do in this world is not money, is not fame, it's not fortune, it's not being known, it's not likes, it's not tweets. I hope we can lead the millennials in understanding that. But John's given us not only a framework for understanding this, not only the wisdom and the teachings and the writings, but he's also given us an ethos. What will our folks say about what we do? Will it be, have you helped people like me, the least, the last, and the lost? Well, I'm truly grateful to be here. I'm truly grateful to be, honor, to be able to honor a great man of God, a great man in our country, and a great man in the kingdom. God bless you.